642. The special meeting of Board of Trustees of Little Elm ISD will be held today, beginning at 630 in Little Elm High School Lecture Hall. The subjects to be discussed are considered or consider, are upon which any form of action may be taken as listed below. Items do not have to be taken in the order of sworn shown on the meeting notice. Unless removed from con the consent agenda, items identified within the consent agenda will be, uh, be acted upon at one time. First item, call to order open session in the lecture hall of Little High School, 1900 Walker Lane, Little Elm. Roll call. Mr. Christopher Williams. Here. Ms. Leanna Hardy. Here. Mr. DeLeon English. Here. Superintendent Lynn Lightheart. Here. Stephanie Gregg. Present. Ms. Melissa Myers. Here. And Mr. Cooper Vigas and um, Is that Alex Flores? Flores are absent. First item, budget workshop. President, Mr. Uh, members of the board, uh, we're pleased tonight to present to you uh, a preliminary budget workshop for 1415. Many of the board members present here have seen the presentation at, at the previous board meetings, but we want to bring all of our board members up to date on where we are on the 1415 budget. Uh, also, you'll find on your at the table some information about the revenue sources and what they are, as well as our expenditures by function as well as our expenditures for the 1415 year by object code, as well as kind of a reconciliation between 1314 and 1415 for non-payroll items, uh, so that uh, you'll have an idea about how we go about the process. We did want to share with you just a little bit about the process. We have a budget calendar that the board approves usually in February of each year. Uh, once the board approves the budget calendar, we have uh, budget training with all of our budget managers, which are all of our campus principals as well as any department manager. We go over the uh, projections for next year with our budget managers, what type of allocations each one of the campuses we have, uh, as well as whether there's new money available, what they need to do if they're looking at new projects or new special programs that they're looking at. Uh, if they need something done on their campuses, uh, we have all types of forms and things for them to utilize in order to bring all that information back to one table. Uh, then we meet as a cabinet and look at all of those items, if, if there's new items being requested, and then we move forward from there. Once we have all our budgets back in, we compile them. While we're doing that, we're estimating our revenues. And primarily, when you're talking about estimating our revenues, uh, the primary sources of revenue for our school district come from the number of students that we have in attendance every day at school, or their average daily attendance, as well as our property values. Uh, this particular year, 1415, and some subsequent years thereafter, we'll have some other sources of revenue coming in from the Tribute, Tribute Homeowners Association. On the expenditures, you'll have your non-payroll. We'll talk about them a little bit, which are primarily your campus allocations and your budgets. For campus allocations, we use $95 per student for the elementary regular ed student. We use $105 per student for regular ed for middle school and $150 per student for your high school students. We also allow allocations for their special populations. If a campus has a high number of bilingual students, or if they have a high number of at-risk students, then we allow allocations based on our funding, which come in the form of a program and tent code. And they have different allocations based on, upon the amount of funds we are to receive from the state. And there's rules about how you allocate those and how you spend those. Typically, our departments are zero-based budgeting. Uh, for the last several years since school finance has taken a hit and funding's taken a hit, we've always, we have not particularly had any new money, money to allocate. But uh, if they have a special request, they have to submit it. Otherwise, they know not to submit a budget higher than the budget that they had submitted in the previous budget year. Our payroll, we always address that in January, February. We ask the board to, uh, to look at those payroll amounts in March so that we can go ahead and move forward with them no later than May. The reason why we do that is a great retention tool. We submit, we send out salary letters. We hand them out usually before our staff leaves for the summer break, break and it always helps with retention. And the board did that in May of this year. It was a 4% of midpoint for all pay, pay categories. Uh, when we're talking about enrollment, there's a little bit of enrollment history on your PowerPoint. The enrollment history is uh, actuals through 1213 because they have been submitted to TEA and been accepted. The 1314 is an estimate and the 1415 is a projection. 
So that's why those numbers are not uh, actuals yet. They're still, we're still in the process of 13, 14, and of course we're projecting to 14, 15. We are using our demographer's projections. Our demographer that we use gives us a quarterly report. That quarterly report also projects our enrollment history, projections out for 10 years. So we use this for this year, especially because of the rezoning that took place with the different campuses and the different uh, opening up the STEM Academy. Uh, logistically, it was just easier to use this because you can imagine always your campus principals are going to tell you that they think they're going to have more kids than maybe our roll-up will do because we roll up kindergartens to first grade, etc. Because of the rezoning, if we use the projected numbers here, we should be a little high, but that means their allocation should be pretty well on target, if not a little over. So they should be fine. We are projected significant growth based on the demographic projection as well as just the economic outlook for our area. So we're projecting a 280A increase over what we think we would be in 1314. As far as our values, our values are coming in strong as well. Uh, the board, I'm sure you're aware that starting in April, April 30th, the Central Appraisal District starts sending us preliminary values for this coming year. Uh, the uh, appraisal review board will receive appeals through June 2nd. After the, all the appeals in for their property values, then they have the uh, appraisal review board that reviews all those and makes determinations about whether or not they're going to reduce the values or not. And then on July 25th, the Central Appraisal District will actually certify us values for the next year. Now that continues to change throughout the years, but your certified values will be received July 25th, and that's kind of the, the, the the number that you use as your starting point. So we have estimated that and uh, been very conservative. Uh, I've reduced that value by about 10%, anticipating loss through the ARB. But even with that, that number is 8.5% up over last year's net taxable freeze value. And the net taxable freeze value is actually the number that you uh, receive levy or taxes from because you'll have a market value and you have to take off all your homesteads and your disability and your ag and all of that. So that, that property freeze adjusted taxable value is really the net of those um, exemptions that come off of it. So you actually receive levy on your adjusted freeze taxable. And when you talk about your over 65s, which we will in a minute, or your frozen levies, then uh, there's another number that we add back to that, which I'll show you. So, if we're projecting a net taxable freeze value of a billion nine hundred eighty-one million dollars, uh, it would be we would be recommending a dollar four as our M and O tax rate for the board's consideration in August. If you take that dollar four, and the dollar four is really the rate that's kind of set by the state. You know, whenever the state legislature passed the law stating that we had to compress our tax rate down to that dollar, and then the boards could raise it back to the dollar four, and then. Uh, boards are no longer allowed to raise it above the dollar four without TRE, a tax ratification election. So pretty much any district that has not done a TRE will be at the dollar four map on the MO side. So that levy is 20 million point six. When I talk about the over 65, we have about 3.2 million dollars of taxes or levy on our over 65 freeze residents, if you will, or parcels. So 68% of that is on the MO side, 32% of it is on the INS side. So we project about 2.2 from M on the MNO side, bringing up our MNO local tax revenue to about 22.8 million, and then a conservative 98% collection rate. Typically, we'll hit that 100% because that levy changes a little bit throughout the year. But 22.3 is for current. And then we add our delinquents, and a lot of times when we do calculations, they want your current levy plus your delinquent levy, not including the penalty and interest on your delinquents, but your current levy plus your delinquent levy. So that's what we use as local taxes. That's our current levy plus about $300,000 of delinquent taxes that we should collect, and historically we do collect about that in 1450. And I can tell you something that's interesting that happened this year. We, we run about total delinquents going back to the beginning of time here. We run about $400,000 is all we have in delinquent taxes from year to year on the prior years. Uh, in April, we received a notice that they did a major, major ag rollback and added $400,000 to my delinquent levy. So we're really sitting with about $800,000 in delinquent prior year levies right now, which is really kind of unusual for Little Lamb. So hopefully those rollback taxes will pop in and that number will go up for us for next year. So this is the first time we've had that kind of significant rollback levy added to our uh, prior years. 
The other thing you talk about on local revenue will be the penalty and interest on your delinquent taxes. That's where that's in other local, as well as uh, interest income on our investments that we have in the bank. Uh, your athletic revenues that come in are also in that, as well as the miscellaneous revenues and your facility rentals. That's what comes up to the four and forty-three thousand dollars. Your state revenue is based on the calculation that we do on our state template. Once we, one of the things that really has a significant impact is because the more money that we collect on this, on the local revenue side, the less money this comes uh, out to be because that's the way it does on the MNO side. The more your taxes go up on your local, the less your state funding comes in. So it's very important to kind of get that correct, even though it'll settle up with you at the end of the year. It's just cleaner if you can estimate it as clean as you can. The federal funds is not federal funding funds like our title money. These federal funds are your Medicaid reimbursement for our SHARs, which has to do with our special ed populations and the services we provide. We can we contracted last year with a third party to help us uh, re recap some funds that we are spending in that area, as well as our impact aid for the lake that we have here in our community that's man-made that we receive some federal funds for because we no longer get uh, property taxes on it. So the federal government kicks in some on that. Uh, you'll see that comes to $49.4 million, as well as the Tribute Homeowners <coughs> Association. The agreement we entered into with the Tribute Homeowners Association when we moved forward with the uh, STEM Academy was that the Homeowners Association uh, would pay to the district on the year that we opened, $550,000 in September of the year that we opened, $550,000 the following April, the same again in the next year, the $550,000 and the $550,000, and then $250,000 for seven years thereafter. So that puts us receiving revenue from this particular organization, talking 2024, 2025. In addition to that, we receive some other benefits, but they really have nothing, they have to do with infrastructure improvements that they're doing and have done. And if there's any questions about anything, please be sure and ask me. Uh, when we're talking about uh, payroll, we're talking about on budget, really talking about on general fund payroll and non payroll. So, just to refresh our memories on compensation, we kept our hiring schedule the same. If you'll recall, last year we went through and reviewed all of our hiring schedules as well as our teacher pay scale <coughs> and made adjustments. So, for 14 15, we were not looking at changing, looking at all of those comps again. Probably Mr. Gutierrez will look at that next year in 15 16 or 16 17. Uh, the board did approve all staffs at 4.0% of midpoint. It is of a midpoint range. Uh, teachers 4% totaled uh, $2,010 per teacher is what it told us on the midpoint. So when we look at our campus budget versus our payroll, you'll see that our payroll in this budget for 14-15 is looking is, is at 82% of the total. 82% of our total is 40.5 million in our payroll. And the other 18% is the campus and departments at 9.1. But we're looking at total, when we get all the budgets back in, we know what our payroll's gonna be, and our staffing, and all the campus and departments have sent in all their, all their uh, items that they requested. We're looking at 49.7 for an expenditure budget for 14.50. We did wanna point out that 18% because I know there's always a lot of interest about how we compile budgets and you know what we do with the money and all of that. And uh, uh, I can tell you I was probably, uh, probably back in 93, 94, <clears throat> I had a board member tell me one time, he says, Lindy, I know you worry about this a lot and you sweat bullets about it, but just think about the fact that you really only have really any latitude over about nine, about 3% of the budget. And I have never forgotten his comment and I always look at it because when you look at the 18%, the $9.1 million, and then I look at my overhead costs that I really have to budget, because we still have to pay the central appraisal district to do our appraisals and to collect our taxes. We have to pay all of our utilities and our utility costs are pretty high. We have over a million square feet of building space that we heat and cool and have water and all those things too. We do have insurance. We have to have insurance on all our property and all of our assets that we have. Our transportation costs are about a million five and that's down from about a million nine to two million three or four years ago when we were with a different firm. We have legal expense that runs as a minimum of $200,000 a year. And plus, we have the leases on the buses that we purchase, plus the tax maintenance notes, that that's about $850,000 a year that we pay for starting last year for the next 10 years. And then under contracted services, these are just things that people don't think about. But we pay for copiers, we pay for our timekeeping systems, which are Kronos and 
uh, ASOP, which is the sub finding system. We pay a, a, a fee to be a member of the Texas Association of School Boards. They, they provide us consulting services. We pay our demographer to make sure that we have good projections and information to make decisions on. We have service centers, and if you're not from education, you probably don't have a clue what a service center does, because I remember when I first started working for a school district, I had no clue why we needed a service center. But you know, over the years, I really you do realize exactly how important they are. They provide a lot of support services for our district, big districts and small districts alike. Uh, we use Texas through them, and we they have lots of training. They have they have they provide a world's worth of uh, centralized uh, services that would cost us a lot to go out and, and uh, secure privately, because that's all they deal with the school districts. So they know exactly what our needs are, and they provide a great service to us. We do have an annual audit that's conducted. Uh, we have Destiny, which is the software system that we use for all of our libraries. We have School Messenger that we use to communicate with our parents. Uh, we have the CIS program where we have the communities and schools, so we have the after school program. Uh, I think I mentioned the subsystem. And then if you just look at our maintenance and grounds and janitorial, oh, that's all, that comes about $450,000. And then our maintenance grounds and janitorial is taking care of us about $875,000. And that's just to make sure that we maintain them internally, if you will. So that's, if you add all that up, that's about 16% of the 100%, or, so there's about 2% there that really goes to your campuses. They go to the campuses based on their number of students. How much is our lease payment for the buses? Is that the 850 total? It's not, uh, that's both of them. The lease payments on the buses are about 356, about 400, and the tax maintenance note's about 400. So there's two things there. It's the leases on the buses as well as the tax maintenance notes that the board authorized to do the renovation at the middle school. Okay. Oh, okay. That's what I was trying to okay. Yeah. And then actually the other thing is there is that the board uh, lease purchased one of our energy systems that there's 102,000 of it is related to that. We still have one more year of paying for that before that drops off our books. So we're kind of watching that because that'll free up some dollars. And I think it ends this next year. Sure. So it was a lease purchase, purchase for our energy system, the TAC system that had went to several campuses. The transportation, what all goes in that besides uh, fuel and, and product personnel? Is there anything else that goes into that? It's actually a dollar per mile. We pay Gold Star, uh, I think it's $2.55 for regular miles that we drive. Plus we pay them a, a, a flat amount per mile for our special ed miles and any extracurricular miles. So it's a mileage. We pay them really, pretty, we don't pay them actuals, we pay them mileage and that covers everything. That covers their personnel costs and the maintenance on the buses and all of those things. And I think we drive about half a million miles a year is what we drive. Okay, so that just kind of shows you that I don't get to do a whole lot. I just got to put the money where it goes. I got to put the numbers where they go, but uh, as far as latitude, there's really not a whole lot of, lot of latitude in our operational budget. And this breaks it down really by object code because uh, we have funds and functions and object codes and sub-object codes. I, our, our budget code is 26 digits and every one of them means something. But the most important things are by function, because that'll tell you whether we're talking about instruction or if we're talking about um, administration, uh, it'll tell you that. An object code's gonna tell you whether those things are your object codes. 6200s, 6100s are all payroll. I can pull everything by payroll. I can pull everything by contracted services or supplies and materials or any of your miscellaneous expenses. The debt payment is those payments that we just talked about is in function 71, so it's not debt on our bonds, it's debt on our lease payments and our tax maintenance notes. And there's always, somebody will budget a little bit of capital, which is items over $5,000 in their life more than, a, in a, more than a year. And so that totals again by object. And here it is by uh, graphically, just showing that 82% is payroll. You'll see contracted services is about 10%, the next one, and that's where we're paying all of our utilities and contract and all of that. Anything 6200 is kind of a contracted service and it's really your transportation and utility expenses and uh, all those things that we looked at on that other page are pretty much your contracted services. And then our supplies about 4% and then you'll see our miscellaneous is about 2% and our debt's about 2% and the capital doesn't even register, it's below percent because it's only $50,000. So that's by object. So that's by 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66. And then the other way we dissect our budget is by function. And, there are, and we put it by major function because instruction has function 11, which is pure instruction. It also has function 12, which is our media. It also has function 13, which is our staff development. So we budgeted, we lumped all of the ones which relate to instruction directly 
the, uh, the twos, which is instructional leadership, is instructional leadership either at the admin level, our interventionist, if you will, and our campus principals, the school campus leadership. Our student services is several things. It's going to be your uh, counselors, your health services, your transportation, your extracurricular, 36, anything that starts with a three will be in student services. Your general administration is your 41s, that's your uh, central office general admin will be in function 41. Function 51, which is really plant services and facilities and technologies and security, those are all in function five, five something, 51, 52, or 53. And then we have community services, which is function 61. We have a little bit of money there, which is really your TRS payment that we make for our 720 fund that we have to pay for out of general fund. And our 720 fund really is our child care activity that we have to pay for the TRS uh, surplus, if you will, out of general. And that's mostly what that is. And then our debt payment is function 71. And our shared services is really your function 9 or 95s. And that really has to do with your JJ AEP, which we have a shared service agreement with, or the Denton County agreements, because those are agreements in that way. So that's why it is by function. And you'll see that there used to be a rule that, you, that they, they wanted to pay, spend at least 60% of your budget on instruction. Uh, that was monitored at one time, and that is no longer the case. But we're spending 62% of our budget on instruction, and that's really a good thing, because uh, that tells you our focus is instruction where it should be, based on the numbers. Then, if you go back to the beginning, I think it's page four or something, where it told us our projected revenues were 50.5 million, our total expenditures were 49.7. So this appears that we have a surplus budget here because we're considering the other sources of the 1.1 million dollars from the Tribune Homeowners Association. So we just want to, and we really went into that agreement stating that we would use the funds that they provided to us to help support that campus. So just so that you know, the board previously approved $350,000 for startup for the STEM because they needed to purchase all those supplies this summer before our budget started. So we took that out of fund balance, if you will, so that we could go ahead and order all those things so that we could start school uh, from our, in August <coughs> with everything that we needed, as well as our technology devices the board approved previously. So that, if anyone asks, that's, you can tell that we're spending the funds that we receive for the STEM with that, and that pretty much balances our budget out, zeroes it out to where we're pretty balanced budget. The next budget, uh, the next fund that the board approves is our debt service fund. Our debt service fund pays for all of the bond issues that we've issued in the past to build our buildings. Uh, again, you use the same, it's really, uh, the part on the debt side is, is that the state really doesn't, it, we're not offset on the state when our values go up, our state contribution does not go down, but we get very little state contribution because they've pretty well reduced all of the funding that they give us. You'll see we get about half a million dollars that I'll show you on a slide here. But it's really good when our values go up on the debt side because it helps us keep that 50 cents per hundred dollars on the debt side. So again, if you take the 50 cents times the 1 point, the billion, 900 million, you get 9.9 .9 million dollars. The freeze is your over 65, that's that 32% of what we to, to get from the over 65, so that's your 10.9. So at 98% it's 10.7 million that we anticipate getting in from property taxes. Uh, again, we get a little other resources from that. We get some investment income and some delinquents, as well as the state does contribute to us a little bit of EDA and IFA based on our buildings and when we build them and how much funding is available. Uh, it depends on when you build them and um, how much funding is available. It's usually about $35 per watt up based on when you build them. So that's why it's not a whole lot anymore. Every year that goes down, but we're still getting about $550,000 projected from the state for that which means that our uh, revenues are going to be $11.3 million. Our principal payment is $3 billion. Our interest payment is eight point two. We pay about $20 million in fees to different agencies that help uh, uh, manage that, if you will, for our total expenditures that we're projecting for 14 15 on the debt side of $11.3 million, which we would be presenting to the board a balanced budget for the debt fund, 240, which is a uh, uh, I mean, 511 is our debt fund, a uh, balanced budget of 11.3 on our estimated revenues and expenditures. And the third, so that tells you that my general fund expenditures, you do budgets by expenditures, not revenues. So we have a general fund budget of 49.8, because that's our expenditures, as well as the debt service budget of 11.3 million, with a proposed debt tax rate of $1.4 on the maintenance and operations side, and a proposed tax rate on the INS side or your debt side of 50 cents for a proposed tax rate of $1.54 that we would be recommending to the board 
uh, to set a date, time, and place at a July board meeting to discuss that and then to move forward with our treatment taxation requirements relating to that. Child Nutrition is the third fund that the board approves. That's Fund 240. We have local revenues that we project. This is really a self-supporting, this is the closest thing that we have really to a corporate uh, entity because they really project their labor costs, they project their food costs, they project uh, how much revenues they think they'll get in by their sales. It's the closest thing to a corporate cost uh, entity that we will find in school business. And they project local revenues based on the number of breakfasts they will sell and a number of uh, lunches they'll sell at 1.1 million. They receive a little state money of 17,000, but most of it is the National School Lunch Program, which again is overseen and monitored by the Texas Department of Ag, which who oversees the child nutrition program. So we're projecting revenues of $2.8 million. Our payroll cost is 1.1, which is only about 39% of per budget. You'll see that uh, a huge hunk of it is in supply, our food cost. So we are projecting a, an expenditures of 2.8, and we hope, as always, we hope that we uh, underestimate our revenues, that we get more money than we think we're gonna get on that side, and we hope we overestimate our expenditures so that we end up with uh, a surplus at the end of the year in all of our funds. We, that's what, that is our goal. That we would be recommending to the board, based on the numbers we have, have a balanced budget for our child nutrition program of $2.8 million as well. That means the three combined funds would be the general fund at 49.7 or 49.8 million dollars, our debt service at 11.3, and the child nutrition budget at 2.8 for a total combined budget of 63.9 million dollars. And then timeline for the remainder of our budget process. Uh, we would do the budget workshop, which we've done just done. At the July 21st uh, board meeting, we would ask the board to set a date, time, and place to discuss the proposed budget and tax rate. We would uh, receive our certified values on um, July 25th and recalculate. And, you know, there'll be a little bit. We've got quite a few openings that we're filling. And, you know, there is a difference. Uh, payroll is like a living, breathing thing. You know, uh, no matter when you look at it, it's going to change a little bit. So we always revisit it to make sure that we're, uh, you know, of course it is a budget, so we're always hoping we underestimate our revenues or underestimate our expenditures. But we will revisit the numbers to make sure there's nothing that uh, is significant that we would need to really revise a lot of the numbers for. And then at August 19th, we'd have a public hearing before a regular board meeting. Uh, conduct the public hearing. After the public hearing, we would adopt the budget, and then after that, we adopt our tax rate. And that's kind of um, very quickly the 14-15 budget. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. You did a nice job. Thank you. Any questions, All right. well, thank you, board. I appreciate it. So I do have a question, and, and it just hit me. So I have a high schooler, right? And uh, I, I happen to check his expenditures, expenditures on his lunch account, and see what he pays for, like Gatorade, mm -hmm. right? Are we charging? Are we marking up the price of Gatorade, or I should say, what's our profit on on that that bottle of Gatorade? Now, Mr. Williams, now I would look really good if I could tell you that. Right, right. So, and, and, and the I reason I ask is because he I buys a lot of candy. <laughs> but I can certainly find so, out for you. So, you get, are I, you saying that you're helping fund in something? I'm funding something. <laughs> but no. And I know we do make a profit because it's kind of a profit set. And, right. and it is the snacks and things that we're The snacks is, and, and everything, mm -hmm. ice cream. Uh, that's kind of our profit set. Yes, sir, there will okay. be. So, yes, sir, there will be. But I'll okay. be happy to check on <laughs> and find out for you and uh, give you that information. Anything else, board? Can you tell me, just kind of on the same vein, I know like the state will give, if they have free reduced lunch, it'll pay for the meal, but it won't pay for snacks, right? Yeah, right. So that's where they make their money. Because yeah. my, my kids are in the same, same boat as your son. Uh, they like their coffees and their muffins and their chips. If you yeah. look at, that's all they buy. He, he can't eat so. regular. I don't. I don't. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm going to send them with a bag next year. Well, and we really do. I mean, I can tell you that Carolyn Carver is a director of child nutrition, and she does an outstanding job. She does. Uh, and uh, they go to several, I've gone with her to a couple, not in this district, in previous districts too. They have big shows about uh, things that you can provide for students to choose from. And we taste and test them so that if we like them, then we think they're going to like them because that is really where you're going to make your profit. It isn't really on the actual components of the meal. You're not going to make it there. It's going to be on your snacks. Mm -hmm. But I will find out, sir. Our contract services, what are some of the contract services that we currently engage in? It's really contract services, one, transportation. Okay. Okay, it's a huge one. Uh, the service center, all those things on that list. The service center, we contract with them. Uh, really, contract to services, 6,200 is going to include all of our utilities. So uh, that's a big hunk of, it's about three and a half million on utilities. So all of those are in 6,200, they're contracted services. That made me think about the, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> um, the fees that we choose now, no, just to kind of refresh my memory, um, the fees that we get for the laptops, that goes to pay for the kind of that usage fee. It's usage fee. It is. It's actually a different fund. We keep that completely separate. Okay. We set it up in order to pay for repairs and, and uh, okay. replacements, and also to help with uh, the, our growth. Uh, we okay. just added. We just took some of those funds to add some device, purchase some more computers because of the numbers that they're anticipating. Okay. Uh, and someone asked us at the thing. We have about seventy thousand dollars in that fund. Okay. That, that's why I was trying to think. Is it? Is that something that's no, on it is not a general fund at all. We have lots of funds. These are the three that the board specifically approves. But we have that in a separate fund so that the funds come in, we monitor it come in. I mean, I have a CPA in my office who is really good at making sure things go where they're supposed to go. Uh, you know, just like your student activity fund or your clubs or any of those funds uh, or your federal funds, which are very regulated. But uh, those uh, uh, laptop ones go in a separate fund all by themselves. And we keep them there. We only use them whenever uh, it meets that. If somebody broke someone, they have to repair it, or they just purchase them based on the numbers coming in. Okay. Yeah, I know my daughter's uh, the wireless completely quit working, and she took it, and I guess they fixed it and everything, and nothing ever came to me bill-wise. And I've heard people say that they've had to pay for certain. So I just didn't know if that was something that was in here that we saw. Depends on no, ma'am, you don't see it. It probably depends on why it got broken. Right. Well, I, yeah, not, trust me, I understand. I yeah. didn't know if that, if, it, if that money was to kind of help offset yes, the costs of some of that. Yes, ma'am, it does. Okay, cool. It does. I think it was a question. Yes, ma'am. And, and you may have already covered this, but I just, obviously your biggest increase year over year is payroll. Yes, ma'am. Did you have a breakdown between that, that difference being the 4% increase versus new staff? Uh, yes, ma'am. I can tell you that the four percent cost. Uh, the four percent was a million two hundred thousand dollars. It was there was probably a little more than that, but I'm just rounding. The four percent uh, when we projected it, and we run it on a set of numbers. And the people who were there at the time we run them was a million two. Okay. That's what it was. So the difference is based on the new. Well, it was, well, we, I was, we compare payroll to payroll, budget okay. to budget. Mm -hmm. So we always track what our, what our payroll was the previous year. So in 13, 14, we started the year with our payroll when we adopted budget at 37.9 million, right. okay? And our, budget, our payroll now is 40 million 595. So I can tell you that what, we, what happened to increase that, because believe me, we check it, is that uh, in September of 13, we added five additional positions because after school starts, we, we all round up, you know, pull the wagons around and see where our one to four is and make sure we have enough student, enough teachers to keep us under that one to four in those classes, uh, you know, 22 to one. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's right. And then actually we had some additional needs in October. We added two additional teachers, teach, and these are teaching positions. And I can tell that really by my numbers because we actually use a flat amount for teachers, an estimate amount. You know, Mr. Gutierrez might hire somebody with 20 years, but then he's going to hire somebody with one year. So it usually averages out. So we use a flat number for what we think a teacher will come in, including their benefits. And our benefits cost us about 12%. So we use a flat number. So we added a total of five and two. And then in this budget, we added six for growth because we really anticipate significant growth. And then the board paid for adjustment is 4.2. And then uh, I shared with some members that the state has a new mandate of 1.5% of a certain percentage of your payroll, and that's to help with the TRS fund. So if you don't pay into Social Security, you're required to pay this. And it really helps fund another way of helping making sure the TRS fund is uh, stable, if you will. Okay. 
and then uh, we have uh, payroll budgets from our canvases. Remember, they get an allocation, right. but they, the allocation they receive for their comp comp compensatory ed for their at-risk kids, lots of times they want to use some of that allocation for tutoring. So if they're going to pay their teachers to tutor it after right. school or in the morning or whenever, then they can take some of those comp ed monies and put it into payroll, and they have to put it below the line and then they it manually into payroll in their org code okay. so that they know they may have $20,000 for after, after school tutoring to help certain kids, you know, when they go to the test or after the test or whatever the case. Do you have any averages on how much that usually comes to per campus uh, as far as that allocation? Well, it's not actually, I think they have I can pretty well tell you, I can tell you what the payroll is. Um, the high school budget, the total budget is three, it'll be on this sheet, which, which oh, do I have? Yeah, you all should have, I think you this have one, this yep, sheet. Yep, yeah, right. so if you have this sheet here, this okay. will answer your questions about that. This will be for 14, 15, the total budget by, by your campuses. And the column next to it that says payroll, those funds that they have in that column there, that is the campus actually budgeting those funds. Okay. And you can, uh, uh, that's really the only thing they budget anything in payroll for is for tutoring. Okay, so these, that would be your numbers for tutoring the Del Pan. And of course we set it up with a specific code so we can track it and make sure, it's not in the whole big payroll number, it's in our code. It's, it's separated out. Yes ma'am. Okay. So that we can track it and make sure that they're, they, they, they spend it on that and all of that. So it, it'll be in that number. Thank you. So I'll get to be the, be the bad guy again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, um, where can we become more efficient at? Pardon? Where can we become more efficient? I do it all the time. <laughs> if you can give us particular items that we can become more efficient at, some of the areas that you're looking at, just to know what you're looking at for efficiency levels. Well, for 14, 15, the biggest thing that I, the, one of the, I mean, last year it was transportation. Okay. It really was. Uh, the chance our transportation cost, because, uh, uh, you know, one of my jobs is to make sure that, uh, you know, I tell everybody uh, that I, I should at least say the district like three times my salary mm -hmm. or I'm not, I'm not doing my job. Now, after a point in time, you know, I've cleaned everything out, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I started out with payroll because payroll is huge, it's compounded. So you go in there and you look line by line and yank everything out of there that's not being utilized so you can put it back on the table again for construction. Uh, you know, payroll's pretty clean. I mean, my payroll people will tell you there's really nothing left in there to go fluff. In our first two years, we really worked on the staffing. Oh, certainly. Because well, if you're going to go in and, and you can see... That's where the majority of your funding is. So we were overstaffed, and we saved I mean, how many positions? Eighty. Uh, there were, I think, seventy-nine or eighty positions that were actually. So we threw it as far as history attrition. that we start with that first because that's where you're going to get your biggest bang for your buck. Now we, because that is as well as tight as we can get it. Now we start looking at other areas where we can save. Okay. Well, so, so what areas are we actually looking at from an expenditure standpoint? Well, CFO, I can tell you where I looked this year was my copiers. Okay. Those copiers. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm telling you, copiers, and everybody, well, there's not anybody here. <laughs> well, everybody can tell you that <laughs> you all don't know this, but, you know, uh, but, you know, I have been working with the copier contractor since the day I arrived, and I had a, we had a five-year contract with them, and it was uh, very problematic, and we really was paying over $29,000 a month for copiers, okay? So uh, we just, uh, the board approved it this last month, but it went from 29,000 plus per month down to 18. That's $131,000 saving over one year. And that's a three year contract, so you're gonna save three hundred seven three or nine thousand dollars over that three year contract and they're brand new they're they're brand new copiers with unlimited copies. And I know y'all wanna hear about these copiers for black and white <laughs> copies and five cents a copy for collars. So you know it has to do whenever any time a contract renews, uh, you know, that's when you're really going to look at it. I can tell you that other areas that we're looking at to save the district money. Uh, we cannot we cannot um, bid le uh, electricity, which is unfortunate, because we have a co-op that we're in, and so we're really we really have no latitude in that manner. But uh, as far as bidding electricity, because it's a big item, electricity is. But every time we have a contract that renews, that's when we really try to make sure that we are getting the biggest bang for the district's dollars that there is. Now I can tell you that other areas we're doing, of course, is trying to look at new sites for the property for the school district. I mean, I'm really involved in that, working with uh, developers to ensure that not only do they provide the land, if you will, but they provide the infrastructure around it, which is very expensive. Uh, the tribute 
on the infrastructure, the road development on the north and on the west side, they're projecting that will cost them $1.1 million, and that's out of their pockets instead of our pockets. So it really has to do with the timing of everything. Uh, I have copies of all contracts. Uh, they are the best contract. I mean, any type of operational thing, uh, you know, this past year we renegotiated that. And, uh, you know, we are receiving more revenues from that program uh, coming in. So uh, any type of thing that comes across my desk, I'm looking to make sure that uh, they're not overcharging us. Same way with construction and contracts. You know, uh, we did things, but even on the conference when we did it, even though we got bids in that weren't bad, we were still able to be able to bid, bid, beat those bids by going out on the DIR and pulling it off. So it's really exercising due diligence on any type of thing that we're going to have to enter into some sort of agreement with and negotiate. Uh, there's lots of agreements that come across. So some of these areas are maybe plant maintenance and operations, mm -hmm. contract of services, supplies. Mm -hmm. Are there any areas there we can have efficiencies uh, by getting better suppliers with certain things? Or are there contract of services that we have that we can improve on? Or plant operations that we improve on? Or any areas there that we can improve or become more efficient? Well, you know, some of those things we've taken the stance that it, it is uh, more cost effective and efficient to like outsource some of our uh, landscaping for our fields. Uh, you know, we have, you know, it's whether or not you want payroll in house and have it year round, or if you want to contract it out and have it as you will seasonal and spread it. So, uh, our athletic fields were a really good area that we were not doing a very good job internally trying to, and you might, some people might say we're still not doing a very good job, but we were really trying hard, uh, and we were working toward that, and we have a plan to try to make sure that they are uh, as good as they possibly can be with, based on what we're given to work with. But we outsource some of that because it's really more cost effective to do it. Uh, you can look at the transportation facility instead of putting it somewhere where I'd have to, where we'd have to pour concrete, and I'm talking about a lot of concrete. But you know, we're putting it in the stadium. You know, that decision had to be made because it was more cost effective to do that. Uh, any agreement we deal with the town, I mean, we always try to make sure we protect the district's interest, even though we're trying to be good neighbors with the town and work collaboratively with them. You know, our first goal is always to protect the interest of the school district. So we. Uh, so you tell me we don't have any areas we can look at. Well, I tell you, I can't tell you. About, I can't tell you anything that I haven't looked at. Uh, if something comes up, I'll certainly bring it to you and say I'm looking at this. Uh, you know, the, the the donations of agreements are currently in the process. That they're in the process. The only thing that was really on the table that I really wanted to get checked off of my list, if you will, and I check things off, is uh, was the copiers. Okay. You know, and that'll take effect in August. That that contract starts in August, and they'll be out doing that. Um, but other than that, I think that we have pretty well looked at every, um, pretty much every source. And we may want to save a little bit on staffing as for as, you know, custodial or something like that, but we just leave that there, again, to where we underestimate our expenditures and overestimate our revenues coming in. And uh, hopefully our, that will be the case in 14 to 15. I'll look at it now. Probably come back with more questions. Okay, well, you can do that. I, 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 like, I like to be encouraged. Well, you can ask me anything you want. I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Next up, featured agenda items. that we're looking at that we need to come up for uh, future agenda items. Uh, I think there were a couple other things that you, you want to look at too. Um, there were some reports that were previously um, asked for and so Mr. English is helping me kind of pace that out and then we'll bring those back to the board. Board. Yeah, Exactly. Um, I think the attorney selection was up for another one. Mm -hmm. um, Lindsay Land mm -hmm. and possibly FTE. Anything else that you guys want to add for comments or as uh, janitors? 
Well, not which I'm not. I just had a comp just the supervisor surveys. Or the, I keep calling it the principal surveys. On oh, principal yeah, surveys. The, uh, Mr. English and I discussed those, and he's going to give some direction on that. And so, okay. Just, it, it, just the result, yeah. No more future agenda items. We'll move on to board comments. Good. Comments? Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you for your job. Great job, Ms. Yes. Engel. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Ms. Harding, anything? I'm good. Yeah, Mr. Williams? No. no sir. Mrs. Gray, anything? No. Thank so, you. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Entertain a motion for adjournment. Uh, move that we adjourn. Have a motion to adjourn. Have a second? Second. Second. Adjourned at, I'm sorry, all those in favor, say hi. <laughs> all those opposed, sorry. Uh, we're adjourned at 727.